Right. Hello and welcome. Barney Hoskins is a music writer, biographer of several decades vintage. He's therefore very well placed to host this discussion in association with Rock's Back Pages about the past, present and future of music writing. Barney's books include the acclaimed biography of Tom Waits, The Side of the Road, and the forthcoming oral biography of Led Zeppelin, Trampled Underfoot. As co-founder and editor of Rock's Back Pages, the ultimate archive of music journalism, Barney is well placed to orchestrate a discussion about rock writing, its past, present, and if there could be such a thing, its future. Please welcome Barney Hoskins, who will introduce the other panel members. Um, things have changed a lot. Um, 
I, I don't just write about music anymore, which is personal choice. Um, I think I just wrote about music, um, and as somebody who <coughs> writes regularly for lots of different titles, um, it would be a, a struggle to sustain a career doing just that. In, other, in another way, I think that um, you know, staying a career as a music journalist is an incredibly ridiculous thing to think of in a lot of ways. You know, if uh, writing about music to pay your rent and or pay your mortgage or whatever seems such an um, idealistic, incredible thing. You know, I feel lucky that I've had a chance to write about bands I've loved, and meet people I've always wanted to meet. Um, but um, I actually teach um, gen uh, journalism to um, some undergraduates who are incredibly interested in music journalism, incredibly interested in music. In the last panel, then he was here. These are, there are people there who still buy music and are still very excited about music who are teenagers. Believe me, I meet them every day, or kind of two days when I'm there. Um, and I encourage them because I know that editors still want good ideas from music journalists. Um, I know for a fact, carefully, because it's Patrick from the Guardian. But, um, uh, I, but I know, not, I don't, I, I can deal past it sometimes, but my panel at Guardian is always excited about young people who know about, you know, footwork or whatever the new genre is, because a lot of people who've been in music journalists for a long time, you know, are kind of, you know, you get stuck in your ways, you, you like, you know, I, I was saying something else earlier on, you know, I can listen to all the new music coming out now, but I'd rather play New World's Technique again and again and again and again, because um, I'm getting a bit old. But, um, I encourage young people to get into it, and they, young people, uh, their voices and their ideas are still needed in music journalism, but if you want a career, let's say, in music journalism, it's a lot harder, you've got to do other things, you've got to stretch yourself. Thanks, Jude. A, a question for Nick Kent. The Australian journalist Mark Maud Hughes has written that the awful truth is that if Lester Bangs and Nick Kent, for that matter, turned up today at the doors of Rolling Stone, Writing at the peak of their powers, he'd be turned his powers, he'd be turned away because they he did not fit the format. If that is true, why is it true? Because I think both Lester Banks and I were just one-offs. And I think it was as much to do with or in fact more to do with the context of the times than than our own particular skills. Um there was a very, very fertile and healthy rock scene in the early 70s when he and I were right, we really kind of started writing. And um, you could really embed yourself, you could really dive into it. I mean, I keep making this analogy, I was talking with Real Marcus, for a thing on it, for a, for a, in a debate on the word about this very subject of partly what it's like for young people to write about music is there any kind of future for them and my feeling is if anyone tried to copy what I did back in the early 70s it would be like diving off an extremely high diving board into like a pool of water that was no more than half an inch deep. I mean it would be an incredibly self-destructive thing to do. I mean my, my situation I mean, both Lester Bangs was different, but my situation stems from the NME. And the NME, when I began writing for it, when Charles Sean Murray and Ian Donald and his started writing for it, the, 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 ad, the average readership was, were, you know, 15 year old schoolgirls. You know, I joined the paper in, in June or July. The paper changed its, its um, style. <coughs> In April of 1972, I joined three months later. It's been, they've been selling 60,000 in April of that, that year. By December, they were selling 200,000. And I remember Nick Logan, who was the assistant editor, calling me in and saying, well, the IPC have done this big survey to find out why all these new readers have come. And I was expecting him to say, well, of course, it's because of you, you big one. <laughs> And he said, and, and he said, what well, and what we what we discovered was that they don't really read anyone. What they buy the enemy for is to look at the photographs 
and the only thing they religiously read every week is the gossip column in the last but one page. Now, after I picked my wounded ego off the floor, I came to a very quick conclusion that this was, I was writing to 15-year-old schoolgirls. This was not the audience. That if I was writing for in Rolling Stone, I'd be writing for people between the ages of 18 and 21. And so this, in my personal career development, was, was a very important moment. Because I was just very, the whole idea of not being read, even though the paper was bought, was being bought by all these people, really pissed me off. And so I became more flamboyant in my approach to writing. I became more flamboyant in my way I dressed and the way I behaved, because I just did not want to be ignored. And in fact, it worked very well. Because at the end of the day, going to extremes gets results. They might not be the results you set out to accomplish, but it's far better than staying in your bedroom and dreaming about becoming a writer. So, but the fact of the, you know, the point I'm trying to make here is this enemy revolution and everything. The people that fought the enemy weren't buying me, or Charles Sharp Murray, or Ian McDonald, or Judy Burchill, or Tony Parsons, or Paul Boy. Maybe a tenth of that readership was interested in those writers individually. Most of them were buying it to find out what hairstyle they did. Because that was the only place where they were going to find that information. Sorry. You know, it was a, the enemy and the melody made to a slightly lesser extent were the only places you could go if you wanted to find out what, what Roxy Music were doing that week. There had a new record coming out, or if Led Zeppelin were playing near you, that was where you went. There was it was an information centre. This right. other, this other, you know, and they knew that they had a captive audience, and that's why, God bless him, Nick Logan had the foresight to say, okay, well, we got these, these captive audience, so let's get these kind of loose cannon guys like Nick Kent and Lester Bangs in, who have an actual point of view, and let's shake things up a bit because they're going to buy the thing anyway because they want to see what David Bowie looks like this week. <laughs> I mean, as silly as it sounds, that's exactly what it was. You have to remember what, you know, the reason why the rock press isn't working anymore is because there isn't a rock scene anymore. Yeah, now people will argue, you know, I think there's good music. I know there's good music out there. I've heard, I've heard there are good new groups. I know that. But back in the day, any city you went to in this country, you could find five up and coming groups worth writing about. Now you'd be hard pressed to find five up and coming good groups in the entire area of the British Isles. It's just a fact, and that's not an old geezer whining. I mean, it is. <laughs> but the fact of the matter is there is a lot less out there to write about, and there's not a scene that works as a melting pot. In the 60s, you had the town of Motel, you had Stacks, you had the bird back rack, you had the Beach Boys. That also was the first time you ever had this though, wasn't it? Yeah, and the, the novelty value of it. You never heard music like this before. When I hear music like, when I hear Amy Winehouse, who's a really talented singer, it's like, okay, well, she's okay, she's doing that early 60s thing, the little Peggy Marsh, the, the, the Phil Spector, the Shirelles. And she's taking that sound and she's adding a bit of hip hop to it, okay. But it's the, the, there's this instant sense of deja vu. There's very little I hear where I think, well, oh, I've never heard this. But before. if you're 18, you've never heard anything. Like that. That's true. That is very true. It kind of completely comes from the position of the age you are and what you've been studying already. And let you take our point. You know, I am more cynical about new music now than I ever have been. Um, I try not to be. I have a brother who's 21 who finds out about new, new music in ways that I could have dreamed of. You know, I had to collect my, remember the first cassette I bought with my own pocket money. I did two weeks of paper rounds in uh, Swansea, where I'm from, and I bought Hat for a Hollow, which was £9.49, a cassette from Woolworth. £9.49 for a cassette. Yeah, it was just ridiculous. And it was specially priced on by me uh, at 
It was nine hundred four. This is the myth. This is, it comes in nineteen ninety four. Oh, when right. the record was released, it's absolutely. Yeah, this one is ridiculous. Yeah, it's it's not, they're 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 not, not, they were not. They were all Warner Brothers. Riveting, isn't it? Yeah. 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 What we're really talking here. What we're really talking about is that the the initial shock value of pop culture has been. Dull to some extent. I mean, Anna Hilda, would you would you, um, would, would you agree that it, inevitably sort of the countercultural power of music uh, has been has been to a large extent modified, capitalised, uh, and therefore there isn't the same sort of revolutionary fervour in in the coverage of it, in the in the, in the excitement of it, in the reporting. I don't know, I mean, uh, I, I want to respond to uh, Nick on one point, because I was a 15-year-old schoolgirl when I was reading it. <laughs> so you're very dismissive about 15-year-old schoolgirls. I'm not right dismissive, like yeah, I'm, not dismissive. <laughs> I'm just saying it's a very particular... <laughs> There's a difference between writing for 15-year-olds that there is for 18-year-olds. It's like, well, the first time I saw Jimi Hendrix, he played two shows in 1967. The first show was for 15 year old schools. Sure. I'm a, I'm yeah. a, my only point is that they're not. And you have, you have to yeah, approach that audience as different. I'm sorry. But I'm not saying that. that can we, I mean, are, is the writing for, shall we say, then the 18 year old music fans now? Why, why is that different? Has the sort of decentralization of media created an environment where there are not one off slightly less capacity? Those voices you engage with in, uh, in the paper. Yeah, I guess I guess looking for that voice is kind of as an editor what you what we're always really what we always really want looking for the magic of the voice and trying to really invite them into our pages. Um, funnily enough, I feel even though that writing often happens on blogs online, where the writer is not edited, where the writer has an infinite uh, word count and so on, uh, can sometimes freeze in the headlines once uh, printed on the page and it becomes. Stilted, it can become, they're trying to write in a way that they think the wire wants it to sound somehow, which is something we, we suffer of from, and new writers wanting to try and write in style because they feel that the wire has style. We're trying to say, please be yourself, and we want all sorts of voices, but um, sometimes it's difficult to, uh, to sometimes that freedom is, is hard to shake out. Yes, absolutely. Um, I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. In terms of the, in terms of the, or the, the, the previous uh, panel was discussing a little bit about the, the, the opening up of genres, the fact that almost slow men um, attracts dance, like a dance crowd in a, in a disco or whatever. Um, this is something that the, the kind of genre explosion is something that we've kind of been doing in the, in the wire for a really long time and it's just become more and more prevalent. I don't think, I'm not sure that there's a rock scene anymore either. I think that people are into all sorts of stuff. It doesn't really, uh, you don't really identify, you can get anything from from a website like Amazon. You can get, everything comes from the, from similar sources in a way. So the sort of specialist retailer is, uh, you know, is in decline. Yes. Uh, someone also pointed out that it's less of a monoculture. I think when I think back to my day, you always read the enemy. And it was a mo monoculture experience because you knew that everyone who thought and, and consumed music like you did was reading this weekly paper. So it was a kind of unifying thing. And of course, it's now it, it, it is so sort of dispersed. Mm. I was going to. I mean, Nick mentioned the word embeddedness um, in, in terms of the access that he was able to get to artists like Stone, Zeppelin. And so an Iggy Pop and so forth. And so I was going to ask Richard from the sort of from from the side of the fence that is that is the record label. Would you say that the music writers who've most championed, say, the big domino acts, have had different relationships to those acts than a writer such as Nick would have had in the seventies? And if so. Yeah. What, what is the difference in that relationship today? Well, it's interesting you mentioned Nick in the 70s with the, with the Stones and Energy and, and all those great articles he wrote. I mean, when there was um, about four of us in the Domino office putting out pavement records, I think there's an element of that with, with sort of Britpop and Logan. There's a sense that um, you know, we've got a lot of power with people in the West End on lavish, major, maybe hospitality and entertainment. 
budgets um, kind of creating this world for themselves that really took over the media. Um, while we were sort of thought people were onto us putting out American music, that was really struggling to find a voice at that time beyond a certain point of critical recognition. So anyone really wrote about what we were doing. Was, was just we wanted to hug and the kind of manager to take on the kind of junk that, that Jude was talking about because we just didn't have that kind of budget. But I'd say the people who sort of get what we have released over the years just tend to be massive music fans. That's what we are. Um, <coughs> Jude, do you think there is uh, any a, a kind of sense of, of ennui in, in pop culture that, that even for younger? writers as an awareness that a lot of things are simply recycled or, or to cite Simon Rowe's retro-maniac? Um, well, I think, I always go back to my little brother, he's 21. Um, I just talk to music, I talk about him, to him about music quite a lot, because he is at, between the age of about 30 and 21, I was the most excited for music I've ever been. I'm still excited for music, don't get me wrong. Um, but he is incredibly excited about music still. He's excited about new music, he's excited about old music, he's downloading classical, modern classical, he's downloading Brian Eno, he's downloading God knows what he's downloading for new stuff. Um, I think one thing that's really kind of quite dangerous in this sort of debate is kind of saying your pop culture is going wrong, but who is it going wrong for? Mm. Yeah. It, oh, could, Simon Rowe's book, which is great, I reviewed it, you know, it's really interesting, lots of interesting ideas. But always I kept thinking, is this coming from you? You, you're a man in your forties. You can, you know you are. Yeah. You're struggling with it. You try not to admit to it. I think sometimes we just go. Do you know what? You know, I'll say now. I'm 33. I'm no spring chicken. I'm not Kellett on a bus pass. I was out there earlier on going. God, I'm glad I'm not a teenager anymore. Um, you know, Factory Four, fantastic. I really enjoyed them. But uh, I was thinking, I just could just go home and listen to King Creosote. Um, I think it's okay. Admit that you, you change, you know, so there are some people in pop culture like you know the John Peels of this world who will just go out and forage and find stuff all the time, that's absolutely fine. I think it's dangerous to say that from our position and as you know cultural commentators or whatever, you know, 21 year olds, 18 year olds, 15 year old girls think this. You know, I find very enlightening in working with um, people in the late teens and early twenties about their interests. I've got lots of young people who want to be music journalists. And they know they're not going to get career out of it. They think, you know, are they going to write from a website or maybe get a few free, free records? Um, I was speaking to a young girl today who has made her own kind of like radio uh, kind of podcast, a conductor podcast. Um, and she really wants to get it out and she wants to meet people, not for any great career. I think a lot of young people are very aware that this is not going forward. But they're also, in terms of recyclability, I think. A lot of young people think that actually is a really positive thing. They can find out about stuff that people, even of you know, me, eight, 15 years older than them, never, well, to get that stuff, my point about being very expensive Smith's set was you'd still, have, in 1990, or whatever that was, 1993, had to save up and get that stuff. You could, you know, take things off friends, obviously, like, you know, you take John Peel's show or whatever. Um, but I think it's actually quite a positive thing. What I'd love to read is a 16-year-old writing about how exciting this stuff is. But, you know, what Anna Hilda said about um, trying to get people from blogs to write for magazines, I think people feel like they have to make that leap and they have to be professional and formal, um, which I think is sad. And obviously as an editor, you have to encourage that and everybody has to encourage that. There is this feeling within young people that this medium is slightly old or kind of slightly um, not out of step with their ways of thinking about things possibly. Um, but I do think it's dangerous for us to go and say, oh, obviously music is dead, music yeah. is dead. Um, because it might be a reflection more of our tendencies within ourselves than yeah. what is actually going on. Well, also, I think the, the obvious thing is to say that, um, that a lot, if you're really anticipating the new Smiths or whatever album, you're really reliant on the, on the privileged position of a music reviewer who would receive this album. Um, yeah. weeks before it came out, and you would be reading that also to, for a description of what it was, what were the track names, what you could see were sitting like this, and you could wait. Yeah. Whereas now, it's normally, I mean, we get, we get albums pretty much the same time as it's released. People start yeah. stop talking about release dates, because it's just like at the time it's manufactured, it's sent to the to distribution, and that's it. It's not, it's not in more and more cases, certainly, in the sort of underground, if you want to call it that. Um, so I think that 
you know, it doesn't, it, the, the music, I think the reviews, the piece, doesn't need that description anymore because you can, you can really go and check it out yourself. So perhaps that, that is kind of uh, slightly removed, but it's also, I think that also needs a, a sort of wider question and, and, a, and a more interesting one, perhaps, where, where the, the writer can talk about the, does this matter? Does this record matter? And why? Yeah. And, you know, is it important? And, and why? So, so you can, I think it's a positive, um, yeah. it's a positive in, as much as anything. I think this is get to, you can get to more interesting points. And I think also in terms of with Wikipedia and with, it, with the onslaught of information and biographies, we have it so easy to check out who somebody is. Yeah. You don't need to buy a Really have to, I think, writers really have to work beyond that yeah. kind of straight biographical stuff. Yeah. You, you've got, you need ideas. You need sort of see, but is see there, put stuff in perspective. Is there also a sense that um, you know when Nick was writing, he could go on the road for, for weeks with these people, and he had access to people. So what he was able to write about was quite rich and biographical, obviously very romantic, and was it occasionally very cool kind of way. And I mean, the access you have, say, to if you're doing a big piece on something, it's become a lot more formalised and a lot more... Definitely. So, you're actually, what you can write about, if you wanted to write something you're about, if you, I mean, you could go up to the, you know, Fourth of Firth and hang out with King Chris, but you'd probably talk about cake and biscuits, you would just write, you know, it would be... I think you could have been slightly <laughs> more... <laughs> yeah, well, of course. I think, oh, dealing with King Chris, I'd like to read actually. I think it's hard... Picking up an anhill at this point, I think it's hard to read records now because you can't fit your, kind of, you can't go all this that genre and that genre. It's not X genre, it's Y genre, it's Z genre. It's not putting thank all these what you do. Yeah. No, thank God, in a way, you've got to be more creative. I find myself being a lot more personal in my writing, which a lot of newspapers and some magazines actually don't like. They say, we don't want you to know your voice and your reactions. But at the end of the day, you know, this is what Nick used to do. You know, it's that your personal experience, that your embeddedness that people will respond to. You know, the pieces I've enjoyed writing most in recent times are probably for the quietus. Um, and the quietus encourage new voices, they encourage, you know, I know, you know, I interviewed Michael Steinfeld recently, he was my childhood hero. Oh, the coolest guy in the world, I grant you, but kind of, I absolutely loved R.E.M. I didn't get that review for an interview, even though I've got a lot of, you know, fairly decent amount of experience now for a big newspaper. And if I did, I knew I was have to write it in a way that didn't actually reveal a lot about him. Right. On the quietest, I had the opportunity to actually write about him in a different way. I had a kind of exit interview style, you know, you're leaving your job, here are a lot of ridiculous questions. And I had the freedom to do that. Um, and interestingly, when I do pieces of that, that is when I get emails. That's when I get comments that go, this is great. That is actually what people want. So you I, I think a lot of the mainstream media actually ignore that. They're more thinking about an artist promoting products. We've got to put star rating on this, when people look into the mainstream, but a lot of people who are in the mainstream still want that personal connection. Well, in 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 that. Interestingly, you know, I mean, I think it could be argued that journalism changed irreversibly during the 80s when it switched from, from being a, a forum for quite opinionated and subjective writing to exactly what you're describing. And I, and I wondered whether, um, for, for Nick, who obviously made such a name of himself in the 70s, Nick, did you feel um, but by, did you feel alienated from the, the sort of culture that you had so much to do with in the 70s? Did, was the 80s quite an alienating decade for you? Yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but Nick, you had the face, didn't you? It you was, the yeah. I, I, I did, it, it's true that I got back in Nick Logan, who edited the, the, the enemy in the 70s, he, he found the face. and he, allowed me to work for it. So I got my sort of a voice back then. It was just alien. I mean, a, if you look at anyone who makes their mark in a particular decade, David Bowie in the 70s, Prince in the 80s, the Beatles in the 60s. Like, it would look what happened to the Beatles in the 70s. Wings. <laughs> Very boring solo albums. Ringo Starr's awful solo albums. The Rolling Stones, after Exile on Main Street, which was mostly written and recorded in the very end of the 60s, lost the plot in the 70s. Bob Dylan. Can't be upstairs. <laughs> but even so, I mean, you know. <laughs> the fact is, I think, I think, um, 
I think, I, think, I think people in general, if they've made their mark on a, beer, on a particular decade, the decade that comes after David Bowie, for example, in his, his 80s were not splendid. <laughs> um, and, and, and they lose it in a very, very kind of spectacular way because they really don't get the context anymore. Or, they do, or maybe they're just jaded and burnt out. Certainly when I was with the Rolling Stones, I noticed that that was Mick Jagger's problem. He wasn't an hugely inspired individual, but he was very, he was a hard worker and he had very good instincts. And his instincts just became jaded because he was, you know, the Beatles and Bob Dylan were no longer his, his betters. They were now the top of the, the pops. And, and, and so, I find it, I see people, can, it's very easy to get jaded in this, in, in this business, for musicians, for writers, for everybody, it's easy to get into that. Yeah, isn't that, what, isn't that what we're, you know, what we need to fight against, that jadedness? Well, we have to fight against it, but the fact is it's there, and, and a lot of people don't recognise it's there. That it's like they continue, but... But maybe today they continue because that's how the newspapers and the magazines are funded from what Jude's talking about, that particular type of journalism. And then um, very limited to go beyond that. I just thought that would be very dangerous to know that you have to write that monthly next record, you know, whatever you think about it. Yeah. You know the record company have got more money to spend than any other record company on that app. And you know you're going to have to put it on the front cover. And you know you want to have a job. And I just think, that's a very, very jaded position. I think a lot of mainstream media just holds that position because it has to have a I think a lot of editors actually just want to do this. I think a lot of editors are editors don't really want to put things up that are interested. Mm -hmm. um, some aren't. And sometimes I'm there kind of going, I really want to write about this band and pitching all this stuff. I'm like, well, what's the story? The story is they're really good. Yeah. What's the angle? You know, or they've been around for 10 years, what's new? There's nothing new. They've just made a great, well, they've made a great new record. Yeah. And it's really good. 